Hi, I'm Colin Dunn. I served a career in the United States Army. My last assignment was at the Eisenhower School, where I was a professor of behavioral science and, and I taught leadership. When I got out of the Army, I decided to form a company that would help leaders build winning teams. I hope that this video helps you be all you can be for yourself and for the team. Today's subject is political savvy. When I was at my 25 year mark in government service, I found myself in a field operating agency which had a single line item in the DOD budget. That meant I had to defend my budget in front of 10 senior people, hard nosed people whose job it was to take money away from me. To make matters worse, that particular year, there was supposed to be a 10% budget cut for all agencies. What to do? I asked around and mingled and I found somebody who told me, go see Bob, maybe he can help you. Well, I found Bob's office in the Pentagon. He wasn't there, but his assistant was. I struck up a conversation with his assistant and got the valuable intelligence that Bob liked to eat at a certain snack bar in the Pentagon. He liked the bratwurst there. When Bob showed up a little while later, I invited him to lunch, told him it was on me. As it turns out, Bob loved to take rookies like me under his wing and show them the budget process. At the end of lunch, he told me, go visit these three committee members. Give them your proposal. I did that. A few weeks later, we had the big meeting. I walked in all nervous, unsure of the outcome. And before I could speak, Bob interrupted and said, you know, I've already seen this proposal. It makes a lot of sense. Two other committee members nodded and they dismissed me without me saying a word. I found out a few days later that I got everything I asked for in my budget. I didn't know it then, but what I was demonstrating was political savvy. See, what political savvy is, is it's not politics. It's, it's not backroom scheming and, and intrigue. It's simply knowing the culture, knowing the landscape of your organization, and every organization is a little different. It's also paying attention to people and what's going on in your organization. It's also enabling yourself to be all the best you can be and to serve your publics the best way you can. It's about being better at your job. What I'm going to do today is take you through six secrets of political savvy people. Now on the screen here, you see a guy telling a secret to a young woman, but truth be told, they're not going to be secrets because I'm going to lay them out for you right now. The first one is practice situational awareness. Uh, the second one is focus on relationships. The, the third is build a dynamic network. The fourth is partner with the boss and the boss's boss. The fifth is regulate your impulse behavior. And finally, anticipate change. Let's start with practicing situational awareness. What is that? Well, first it's knowing the culture. It's, it's knowing the landscape. It's, it's knowing uh, what behavior is acceptable and what is not acceptable. It's knowing what your wiggle room is in making decisions. It's also knowing what minefields to avoid. What places that if you go there, you do so at your own peril. How do you find that out? Go to the coffee pot. <laughs> Ask questions, listen to people talking, and you'll pick it up. Secondly, learn the key decision makers. The people making the decisions aren't always the boss or the boss says. Sometimes they're people that influence the boss, people on whom the boss or bosses rely on their counsel. Know who those people are. Thirdly, mingle strategically. What do I mean by that? Well, you have optional meetings that happen all the time, you know, celebrations, birthday parties, promotion parties, etc. Go to them. Meet the people there. Get to know the people behind the job descriptions that you work with or might or you think you might work with at some point in the future. Also, mingle strategically in a formal setting, just as I did when I tried to find out how to work the budget. Uh, if I didn't mingle strategically and find out who Bob was and, 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 and meet with him offline, I wouldn't have known that those three meetings with those committee members were the important three meetings I had to have before the big meeting. 
Also, notice nonverbals. Start with yourself. How do you come across at meetings? If you're the kind of person that goes to a meeting and you like to get real comfortable and lean back in the chair and kind of look at the ceiling, uh, that's fine if that's how you're comfortable, but what message are you sending if you do that? Could you possibly be sending the message that you don't care about the speaker or about the team as a whole? Very possibly. Let me give you a tip. After an important meeting, find someone you trust and, and ask them, how did I come across? Am I coming across as a team player? Am I coming across as interested? You know, am I looking at the speakers when they're talking? What are your impressions? You might learn something about yourself and might find a way to change your body language to leave a better impression at the next meeting. The next secret is focus on relationships. You know, years ago in a presidential election, uh, one of the candidates had a sign made and he read every day when he got up in the morning and the sign said, it's the economy, stupid, like right here on the screen. To remind him that when he went to talk to people and gave his stump speeches, to talk about the economy because that's what the American people cared about. Well, in political savvy, the equivalent is, it's the relationship, silly. It's all about the relationship. The relationship is what holds, is the glue that holds people together on a team. The, the relationship is how things get done. Let me give you a couple of tips. One of them is treat everyone with respect. Don't get hung up on rank. We've all heard the story about the guy who goes to visit a senior person and ignores the executive assistant, only to find out later that the executive assistant is more than an executive assistant. That person is a confidant of the senior person, an action officer. Don't, don't make that mistake. Give everybody the respect they deserve. Also, show genuine appreciation for people. If someone does a good job on your team, even if you had nothing to do with that project, show appreciation for that person. If someone helps you or gives you some counsel that works out, get back to that person and tell them how much you appreciate what they did for you. Also, show your boss appreciation. If your boss does something that you really appreciate, that you like, let that person know about it. Tell her. You know, a lot of times bosses don't get much feedback and, and they appreciate it more than you realize. The next thing we need to talk about is identifying outside stakeholders and prioritizing. Every organization has stakeholders, people outside the team, outside the organization even, on whom they depend for their success. Who are those people? And you can't take care of all of them equally, so what's the priority? What's the pecking order? How do you find that out? Talk to the boss. Listen to the boss when the boss talks. Boss's prioritize, priorities will direct your prioritization of those stakeholders. Also, don't interact with people only when you need something from them. Those stakeholders we just identified, the first time you meet them shouldn't be when you come in and you need something from them. It, it, it should be a time when you're just going by to see them and asking them about their interests. In fact, maybe even doing some homework and finding out what their interests are. Zig Ziglar, a famous motivational speaker, said something I think that's very appropriate for us. He said, the only way to get what you want in life is to find enough people and give them what they want. It's counterintuitive, but it, you know, and I think in your heart, that is a true statement. Let me give you a tip. Draw a relationship map of you and your organization. Now, here I've got a map with myself at the center. That's me, Colin. And I've got lines going to various people. You, use your own legend. For example, on this uh, map, I have a short line between me and Joe to show that I've got a good relationship with Joe. But over here, look how far away I am from Sue, and yet Sue might be more integral to, to what it is I do at work than Joe is. So maybe I need to shorten that line with Sue. If this line here between me and the stakeholder wasn't there, maybe I needed to establish that. The point is, map it out. Draw it out on a piece of paper. It'll help direct your time as you try to improve and enhance relationships on your team and outside your team.
The next secret is to build a dynamic network. Now this picture shows people standing in circles with connected lines and it's not quite that, quite that formal, but you know what's very important. The first tip I want to leave you with on this is go back to your relationship map. Go back to that map and ask yourself who on the map is the kind of person that gets things done? Who is, who is known as the person to go to if you want something done? Now, maybe that's the person you need to know better than you know them now. Find out how they operate. Why did, that ha did they get that reputation as the person that gets things done? Uh, secondly, who can be a mentor or an advocate? Now, people know about mentors. Mentors are people you go to uh, when you need advice, people that, you, that guide you along your career path. But you also need advocates. Those are people who speak positively about you to others. You need both. Maybe there's a mentor or an advocate on your relationship map. The next bullet is build alliances and advisory boards. Who are, do you have on your map that you could use as a teaming opportunity to prepare yourself for some upcoming project? What alliances can you make to make that project go better? Also, you need an advisory board. Well, what's an advisory board? That's, that's just a group of people who are sounding boards. It, that might be somebody outside your organization. It might be a neighbor, it might be a spouse, but this is somebody to get a second opinion uh, uh, from if you need it, a warning. Never gossip, never criticize anybody. If you're at the coffee pot and you participate in criticizing someone or in gossiping about it, Understand this, when you leave that group of people you've been gossiping with, you're leaving them with the impression that you're capable of gossiping about them as well. You're capable about criticizing them as well. Don't get involved in that. That erodes trust. It's not good for you. It's not good for the team. Now, on a side here I want to make is this. What we've been talking about thus far and these secrets is a lot about you and you leaving a good impression about you and you building a network about you. Don't get me wrong, it's not about you. It's about making you the best person you can be for the organization. It's about delivering the best service you can deliver. Here's a tip. The way not to get a mentor is to walk into that person's office and ask them, will you be my mentor? A better strategy is to find somebody whose wisdom you admire in the organization. Go to that person and ask them for some genuine counsel that you need. Take that counsel, come back to that person later and tell them how it went. What you've told them is, I'm willing to be your protege. It's up to them whether or not they take you up on that and decide to be your mentor. That brings us to the next secret of uh, politically savvy people, partnering with the boss or bosses. Now you want to do this even if your boss looks like the guy in this picture, you know, older guy, white hair, looking pretty stern. Sometimes bosses come across like they don't want to be partnered with, trust me, they all want you to partner with them. First of all, promote the boss's priorities. That implies that you know what the boss's priorities are. Be a champion for the boss's priorities. They will appreciate that more than you realize. Secondly, master the big picture. Try to put the lenses on of your boss as you look at the organization and the projects going on and the things that are happening in your organization. I, I can remember one time when late in the day, the boss called me in, a team leader, with other team leaders, and he told us all there was one team that was struggling with a project, and he wanted us, if we could, to help that beleaguered team with a project. We were all very busy, so most of the team leaders gave some excuses about being overloaded and left, but I saw in the boss's eye that this was really important to him, so I went back and I gave my best people up to that team that was in trouble. As it turned out, the project was a huge success. And my team stock went up in the eyes of everybody in the organization. 
didn't hurt my reputation either. The next step is include the boss. Now we all, I think, know to include the boss on updates and, and we'll probably do that regularly, but are we also stopping in and telling the boss of little successes that we have? They're interested in that. They also want to know about problems. If there's a potential problem coming around the corner, even if you're not positive it's going to manifest itself, it doesn't hurt to stop by and tell the boss what's coming at them. Boss appreciate weather warnings like that. They also appreciate it when you include the boss on little activities on your team. For example, if you're going to give an award to somebody, a certificate to somebody, or, or have a little celebration, invite the boss down to participate in those things. Bosses love that kind of contact with line staff, and they don't always get it. Here's somebody who did get it. Who is it? It's the Fish and Wildlife Service. On this slide, on the right side, you see the Fish and Wildlife Service goals. Now, I took this a few years ago off the Fish and Wildlife website, and they list their goals. One, two, three, four goals, right? Well, the way they show them on the website is they align their goals with their boss's goals, which is the Department of the Interior. Isn't that interesting? Why would they do that? Well, it isn't to kiss up. <laughs> it isn't to brown nose. It's to show the boss that what they're going for and what they're trying to achieve will help the boss achieve what he or she is trying to achieve. The other way that helps is if the Fish and Wildlife Service needs any resources to help them with their goals, when they go to their boss, their senior headquarters, there's a good chance they're going to get it because the senior headquarters understands if I give them these resources, then indeed it will help me achieve what I want to achieve. The next secret we're going to talk about is regulating impulse behavior. You see the picture on the screen here? That young lady looks like she's going to either scratch herself or scream or both. We want that to be your inside behavior, not what people see on the outside. First tip, don't always say what's on your mind. Now I know this is common sense, but it happens all too often in the workplace. I was out at a dinner one time one night and my boss came up to me after the dinner and she said, Colin, tell me how I should change my, my leadership. What should I do differently to be more effective for the organization? Well, I knew at that moment enough about the boss to know that she had a little bit of thin skin. So my answer was, boss, off the top of my head, I, I can't think of anything. I'll tell you what, if, if I do think of something in the coming days, I'll, I'll, I'll come talk to you about it. She thanked me and let it go. I found out that was the right answer. Later on, a colleague of mine got asked the same question by the same boss. He came up with a couple of things she should change about her leadership, and she never forgave him. Think about the implications before you respond to your environment or to what people are saying. Lao Tzu, the ancient Chinese philosopher, said it this way, there's a difference between a reaction and a response. A reaction is what you do instantaneously, without much thought. A response is what you do after you've considered the consequences or implications of that action or that speaking that you do. Try to make most of your responses, responses, not reactions. Also, know your hot buttons. You know on a pretty much on a regular basis what sets you into a place where you might display some emotions you wouldn't want to display. You know the situations. Recognize those situations and prepare to respond differently and not react emotionally when you hit your hot buttons. Here's a tip. Use what I call the self-management two-step. If you know that at, the, we're at work or at home, you find yourself in a situation on a regular basis, it's not happened once, it's not happened twice, maybe three or four times, where your button has been pushed and you respond unhelpfully to the relationships at home or the relationships at work. Identify those times. That's the first step. Just sit down and identify those times when you respond unhelpfully. Secondly, choose a strategy to try to do it differently the next time. 
Maybe it's taking a deep breath. Maybe it's taking a drink of water. Uh, maybe it's counting to 10. Do what strategy works for you for those situations. The next and last secret is anticipate change. The only thing that's constant in our government life is that changes are going to be constant. First, read the tea leaves. You, you can kind of tell what's, what's coming around the corner at you. Uh, Colin Powell used to say it this way. He wanted to hire leaders who could see around corners and, and kind of guess what was coming at him so he could prepare the environment to receive that. Now, what you need to be is you need to be a future scout. Bosses love future scouts. Bosses love people that start the conversation at the meeting this way. What will be the impact of fill in the blank? The new senior boss coming, the impending budget cuts, whatever you see coming around the corner, how should we get ready for fill in the blank? Start by asking those questions, not coming up at the meeting and, and announcing that you know what's going to happen because we really don't know everything that's going to happen to us. But the boss will appreciate somebody who's going to be a future scout in this way. Before I leave you, I want to remind you of these six secrets so that you can remember them and employ them in the way you operate at work. Remember to practice situational awareness at meetings and understanding what's going on. Focus on relationships. Relationships are the glue that holds everything together. People are how it happens. Build that dynamic network and do that before you need the help. Partner with the boss. Reach out to the boss and, and tell him you're his champion for his priorities or her priorities. Uh, regulate that impulse behavior. Keep that stuff that's damaging to you and to the organization inside and anticipate change. Be that future scout the boss needs. Political savvy is not just about navigating the organization. It's about helping you and your team deliver the best service it can for your constituents, for your customers. It's not hard, it's not rocket science, and it can start with you. I want to leave you with a couple of books for further study. Joel DeLucal's book on political savvy is the most comprehensive one I've seen. I like William Gentry's pamphlet, it's a short pamphlet, published by the Center for Creative Leadership because it's short and to the point. It's the Cliff Notes version. And then finally, Joe Sweeney's book on network. Networking is a contact sport. It's just a fun book to read. They're my three favorite books on political savvy, if you're interested. Thanks for listening.